broadcasting in Johannesburg on 1485 AM and nationally on DSTV audio channel 169. Conversations with Nikki, powered by studyapps.co.za. Well, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, one o'clock exactly. My name's Nikki Seberini, and thank you so much for joining me. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm delighted to be on radio today. And of course, this uh, brand new show, Conversations with Nikki. And really, that is what the show is all about. It's about conversations, it's about people's stories, their testimonials. We're going to get ordinary South Africans, we're going to get celebrities, we're going to get uh, deep thinkers to come into the studio to share their thoughts and ideas, their expertise, and hopefully you're going to be inspired and you're going to uh, want to go out and do fantastic things and then you in turn will share your story with us. So we're going to be kicking off today's show with a story that I think has resonated very, very deeply with not only South Africans but people all around the world. And I suppose it's done that for a number of reasons. Now, if I had to ask you the question, what is your greatest fear? Every person would come up with a different answer. And the one thing, of course, that just hovers there for, for a while and then we move on is that notion that, that one day we are going to die. One day there, there will be that point when, when our heart stops beating and then we move on if that's what you believe, or we just stop living completely. So when we consider that, and we consider that uh, there is a finite time that we, we spend on this earth, and people share stories where they've come so incredibly close to death, we are drawn to those stories. We're drawn because we have fears, and we have fear of death, and we have fears of all different things that can happen to us in this lifetime. And I think that that is why the story of Brett Archibald has just had such an impact on so many people. This is a man, he's a South African businessman, he's a surfer. He went on over to Indonesia, and an extraordinary thing happened. I'm not going to tell you any more. We're going to have Brett on the show uh, in a few minutes. He's going to share his story. What I do want to tell you, though, is that we will be opening the, uh, the, the lines a little bit later. From about 1.30 onwards, we'll be opening the lines. If you have any questions for our guest, Brett, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer them. But I warn you, you'll be shocked. You'll be, you'll be horrified. You'll be inspired. Um, you may even be saddened, but it is indeed a story. And perhaps some of you have heard of the story. And perhaps you have not. Um, we're also going to have some experts who are going to expand on the story. Vanna for Mark from ER24 Communications will be commenting on Brett's story. And then Pam Zeman, a psychologist, will in, be in the studio as well looking at that. So that is what is coming up. I warn you, it is a spell-binding story, so do not go anywhere. Also, just to tell you that you can follow us on Twitter. I don't know if you're on Twitter yet, and if you're not, you have to um, enter into the Twitter sphere. It's absolutely fantastic. My Twitter handle is at Seberini. I'd love you to follow me, and we will be tweeting throughout the show. You can also send any emails if you have any suggestions, any feedback. I would love to hear from you. And my email address is Nikki, that's N-I-K-I, at Nikki Seberini. Com. We're going to take a quick break and then Mr. Brett Archibald will be joining us on the line. It's time for straight talk in South African sport. Join me, Graham Joffe, as we scrum down with players, coaches and administrators. Sports Fire every Monday and Thursday evening at 5.30 right here on Radio Today, DSTV Audio Channel 169. For questions and comments, email joffers at sportsfire.co.za or on Twitter, joffers my boy. Sports Fire, proudly powered by Rico. Hi, I'm David Shevers. Hi, you're listening to Harry Sideropoulos. I'm Malcolm Terry. Hello, from Michael Richard. Hello, from Fiona Ramsey. And, and if, if you're, you're listening, listening to us... us then, then you're, you're lucky, lucky enough, enough to, to be, be listening, listening to Radio, radio today. today. Today, South Africans share their lives with you here on Radio Today. He's back, David Batsoff, and back on Radio Today. Yes, he is with a brand new travel show called Travel and Things, proudly brought to you by Higher Safari Ranch in Mulder's Drift. Tune in every Saturday morning between 10 and 11 when he'll bring you the best, the latest in local, international, national 
and even some travel tips and tricks. So that's travel and things right here on Radio Today, radio that delivers. Hi, I'm David Shevers. Hi, you're listening to Harry Sideropoulos. I'm Malcolm Terry. Hello from Michael Richard. Hello from Fiona Ramsey. And, and if, if you're, you're listening, listening to us, us then, you're then you're lucky, lucky enough, enough to be listening to Radio Today. Today. Today, South Africans share their lives with you here on Radio Today. Studies have shown that students retain 50% more of the information they've learned if they take practice tests while learning. Study apps provide all the practice tests any student could ever ask for in an interactive and stimulating way. Study smarter, not harder with studyapps.co.za. And of course, Conversations with Nikki is powered by studyapps.co.za. Um, well, with the introduction, I spoke about uh, a guest who has been traveling all over. He's been sharing his story. People are just following the story because they're so fascinated by what happened to Brett Archibald. And we really, really are delighted that he's taken time out of his busy schedule to share his story with us. Brett, good morning morning and uh, good afternoon, I beg your pardon, and, and uh, welcome. Hi, Nikki, how are you? Very good, thanks, Brett. I can, I can tell that this isn't a fantastic line, um, and if it's not good, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to call you back. Okay. So, Brett, I mean, how would you describe this whirlwind experience? Have your feet come back down to earth yet? Nikki, it is slowly, slowly coming back to normality, but I really don't believe any day of my life going forward will be the same as prior to, to my ordeal. Um, yes, I've been, I've been accosted by the press from all over the globe. I, I um, have had a fantastic story, and it's been a whirlwind trip, but I'm very happy to be back in my hometown of Cape Town and getting some normality back. Britt, I haven't hinted at all to this uh, extraordinary experience that you've had. Perhaps you can tell us. First of all, I mean, why, why were you in Indonesia? I, uh, we try and get, there's a group of my friends from, we all grew up in Westville in Natal, and there's a group of Westville boys we try, we're not surfers, I mean, we surf as hobbies, we're all businessmen, and we try and get together with great friends from many, many years. In fact, we've been together since, most of us, since grade one. And we just try and get together, uh, bond again every two years and travel to in Indonesia and get down to the Mentawi Islands, which is uh, just off the coast of Sumatra. And we just spent 10 days surfing and catching up and just having a really amazing time. And that's, it was that time of the year. We had planned this trip from January last year. And we all flew into Padang from different destinations in the world. Australia, um, uh, Dubai, mm. there was a friend of ours who was coming from Dubai, one from Mauritius, uh, Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town and we all, we all met up in Padang and jumped on this boat to head across to, to the Mentawi Island. Listen, it sounds like paradise and a dream come true, but in fact your dream turned into a nightmare. So we're going to take a very quick break, Brett, because unfortunately uh, it's not a clear line. Okay. And you've got such a fascinating and moving story to share with our listeners that we're going to take a quick break and uh, we're going to call you back. Okay. Thank Great. you, Brett. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. You're tuned to Radio Today. This is Conversations with Nikki. My name's Nikki Severini. Um, I have Brett Archibald on the show today, and he's going to, as I said, be sharing his story. So he meets his friends uh, once a year. They go surfing, and it sounds like a dream come true, but in fact, it did turn into a nightmare. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be back, hopefully, with a clearer Brett Archibald. 
Welcome to Radio Today, broadcasting in Johannesburg on 1485 AM and nationally on DSTV Audio Channel 169. Hi, my name is Esvier Prinsler and I'm the HID of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za Hello. So Phil Collins, uh, well, he was going to start with his song, but I do think that uh, Brett Archibald has a far more interesting story to share. Brett, are you with us? Uh, please save me. Take me out of... No, that's not Brett. Brett, are you there? I am. Oh, finally, Brett. And we can hear you loud and clear. You've got such a lovely voice. Thank you so much. <laughs> you. Okay. You. Can, can you hear me, Brett? I can hear you perfectly. Should we go ahead? Let's go ahead. Okay, so, um, there we go. So, um, you were telling us, once a year you meet with your friends, um, you go along surfing, but it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. What happened that fateful night? Okay, we'd arrived, um, unfortunately for all of us, we'd had to travel a very long way, and uh, Singapore Airlines no longer have a flight directly into uh, the port of Padang, which is on the coast of Indonesia. So we'd all travelled for just over 40 hours by the time we met up. Wow. 
we we uh, boarded our boat. We were hoping to have sailed early um, in the afternoon, and we were informed that we our boat could only leave at nine o'clock that evening because of the tide in the river. So we all had a a lunch at a local little restaurant, which um, we had uh, the good old Indonesian nasi goreng. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, of the nine of us. Uh, six of us were violently ill that night. We not, none of us can work out whether it was the lunch or the dinner. We Soon after lunch, at about 3.30, we were taken to our boat. It's the fir first time most of us had been on this boat. We'd, we'd all been before and been on different boats. Uh, two of the chaps had been on this particular boat last year, and so they were familiar with it. We all acquainted ourselves with the boat. We were sitting on the top deck just catching up from a bunch of friends who hadn't seen each other for a long time, sitting on the boat, had a few beers. Um, a lot of questions were, were you drunk? Um, I don't think any of us uh, were, were at that stage. We had a good friend of ours from our year had passed away on a Saturday morning. This was now Tuesday evening. Mm -hmm. So we had a bit of a m little um, memorial to him, and we're talking about him and our friend who been diagnosed with some can a malignant uh, melanoma in his back, so he's sure. pulled out of the trip at the last minute. And it's it's a process. You, there's a, there's a long crossing. It's 150 nautical miles from Padang down to the Mentawi Islands, just a complete open. It's called the Sumatra Strait. And we've all all of us had been. There were two new new birds on boats that didn't know about it, and we know how dangerous the crossing is. Number one, and how far it is. And interestingly, 10 years ago when we were there, we nearly lost a friend overboard um, due to the, a very stormy condition and just pure fluke saved mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And so we were all very aware of it. We, we, we set sail at just after 9 o'clock. Um, the chef on the boat hadn't wanted, hadn't wanted to cook dinner that night, so they'd gone out and got pizzas from a local pizza joint. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure Indonesia will ever be renowned for its pizza. I was going to say, was it a good pizza at least? No, well, that's the whole thing. You know, I, I, I remember eating this pizza with like a calzone. So it was folded over and it was filled with mints. Mm. And while we were eating it, I noticed the mints was incredibly black. Oh. I said to my friend from Mauritius, uh, Benoit uh, Mangon, I said to him, um, this is not, <laughs> this doesn't look so good. But I, I think we were all very hungry. It was probably... Uh, quarter to eight, nine o'clock in the evening but that we were eating. And then we all retired upstairs to the top of the boat. There's a big open deck where we started assembling our surfboards, putting our fins and taking, you bubble wrap your board and all that so it travels well. So we're just sitting on deck and, and that was basically the process. We're just a good bunch of friends catching up. I think most of us kind of retired down, down to our cabins at around midnight um, I remember getting down to my cabin and um, checking, checking my, my, my phone because I'd promised to phone my wife, which mm. I hadn't done. And by that stage, you, you lose signal. There's only certain places in the Mentari Islands that you have signal. And I remember thinking, oh, I haven't phoned Anita, and I felt so bad about it. But there was nothing I could do. So I actually just sent, I'd sent an SMS, but it wasn't going through. Mm. And I jumped into bed. At about, well, it, in fact, I remember precisely because I remember looking at my phone at 1.37 a.m. I woke up and uh, needed to go to the bathroom and the boat was really bouncing heavily and we were up and my, my friend Jean-Marc Tosti and I, we were in the front, front of the boat and I thought, wow, we've got a bit of a rough crossing here. But it all felt comfortable. I went up to the head. On my way up there, two of, the, two of our friends had started being violently ill. Um, I went into the head, and as I sat down, I just, I literally exploded from both sides. Oof. And I just went, oh, this is not good. Anyway, long story short, there was a mm. horrific, I was probably in the, in the bathroom for just over half an hour. Oh, terrible. I came out um, into, the, and, and the bathroom leads onto the galley area, which is like a little lounge uh, place where you eat and place to make tea and coffee. And I noticed, I saw the time was just after 2, 2 a.m., and I thought, I really need to get some fresh air. I was feeling horrific. I went out onto the back uh, deck of the boat, and this friend of mine, Benoit, who I sat next to during dinner, he was out there just with a bucket in his hand, retching. And I said to oh him, we need, to get, we need to get on top deck and get some fresh air. 
So he got up and we climbed, there's, it's quite a steep um, ladder that goes to the top deck of the boat. We got up there, he promptly lay down on the bench that was there. I was sitting on the bench. Um, I remember him saying to me, um, how long do you, do you think we've got to go? And I actually went into the captain's cabin and spoke to him and, and we were expecting to be in the, in the, at a place called Telescopes, which is a surf spot at 7 a.m., and he said to me, no, Mr. Brett, long time, big storm, only get there at 9 o'clock. Hmm. So I came out and I passed the good news on to Benoit to say, uh, Banger, we, sorry, but we've got a long, long way to go. And that, the last conversation, he sat up and he started laughing. He calls me Jetman because I used to fly all over the world. Mm -hmm. He said, Jetman, are we having fun yet? And another friend of ours who was one of the chaps who didn't get ill had come up to the top and said, hey, how are you guys doing? Benoit promptly responded by um, exploding into his bucket. Oof. And I saw that and felt ill again. I just grabbed a Coke out the fridge. I drank the Coke. I went to the side of the, the boat and I was holding on the railing and I just started retching. And I, and I retched once, which was just pure Coke. The second time I retched, there was a lot of bile. The third time I rest, nothing came out, but it wrecked my body so badly. I just, I remember myself thinking, if I, if I vomit like that again, I'm going to black out. But this is a horror story, and it's no, only just begun. It's just horrific. Oh. And the next thing I woke up, I was actually in a dream. I was in, in my bunk. It was, it was, I was so comfortable. It was nice and warm. And my roommate, John Mark, was pouring water on my face, nice warm water, and saying, come on, Arch, we're at the surf spot. You've got to get up. And I, just, I was saying to him, JM, please don't wet my bunk because it'll be wet for the whole two weeks that we're on this tour. Mm. And I opened my eyes, and there was the boat, and there's a little tender that tows behind it. They were 100 meters in front of me, the light blazing, and I was in the ocean. So you passed out, Brett. You landed in the water. You were yep. dreaming that someone was pouring water on your face, but in fact you were in the sea alone, and the, and the boat was sailing away. That's correct. I was in the middle of the Mentawi Strait or the West Sumatra Strait, and I knew exactly where we were because I'd just been in the cabin, a captain's cabin. He showed me on the GPS where we were and how much further we still had to go. And I literally realized I was dead. I, I know I'm a, I'm a, a qualified skipper. I've been in the ocean my whole life. I, know, I knew where I was. I knew the chart, where, how far land was on either side. And I just knew there was no ways I was ever going to be found, you know. So was, that, was that the first thought that crossed your mind? This is it. Was, it's yeah. over. I said, this is it. It's over. You, this is where you're going to die, Brett. And I actually, I mean, interestingly enough, I, I am not a p particularly religious person, but I actually had a very wry smile on my face and looked at God and I looked up to the sky and I said, so this is it, this is, this is your, your story of your life, this is where it's going to end. Hmm. I actually asked, am I going up or am I going down? You know, I didn't know. And I hmm. immediately talked to our, our recently deceased friend, Rob Debeer, and I said, Rob, where are you? Are you up or down? Because I'm coming to join you, but... Hmm. And that was it. I, 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 um, uh, that, that, those were the first thoughts that went through my mind. I just went, oh, my goodness, I'm, I'm done. I'm not. And then, the, then, then, I mean, the thought processes that started racing through my head were just incredible. You know, I've got a young family. I, I said sorry to my wife. I said sorry to my kids. My daughter's nine and my son's six. And I just said, Zara, Jamie, I'm so sorry that you're not going to grow up with a dad and... I said goodbye to my wife. And then I actually, I mean, I don't know how long that process was. I mean, I was just treading water at the stage. The sea was really rough. It was raining. Was it I, cold? No, no. Fortunately, the water is very warm over mm -hmm. there. The mm -hmm. tropical, tropical islands. So the water was very warm. I had a T-shirt on and I had a pair of shorts on. And um, I just thought, yeah, this is it. I... I uh, I said sorry, and then I got very angry. I got very angry with mm. the world and and God, and had a a whole process of really just screaming and shouting at at what I felt was the injustice of of the way I was going to die. You know, I just thought I'd, I I I realized we all fallible, and I've always wondered what the meaning of life is and where where it ends up. 
So that was certainly one place I never thought that's, that's the way I would I'm go. Sure. But, I mean, so, Brett, I mean, you're sounding hopeless at this stage. You feel that there's no way out. There's no way you're going to survive. You've said goodbye to your family. You're going yes. through an angry stage. At what point did you start to feel that maybe, maybe you could survive? Well, interestingly, I, I, after having this entire tirade of ranting and raving, my mind just kind of kicked into this absolute calmness. And it, it kind of said to me, um, look, I, I'm very fortunate. I've been the managing director of some big companies around the world. And I've been exposed to a huge amount of, obviously, corporate training, personal training. And it was just amazing because the, this... The one thing I've learned out of this whole thing is the the absolute will to survive and desire to survive of the human human being and human mind is so strong that my mind I went into this absolute calm state and interestingly never once during the entire 28 and a half hours that I was in the sea did I feel any form of fear. Still a big question in my mark ma- in my mind why I never felt mm, fear. Mm. But I felt absolutely no fear. And I, this calmness came over me. And the first thing that came to my mind were, were, you know, life's about choices. And you've got two choices here, live or die. Mm. Um, and obviously, my, I, I chose to live. And I said, okay, to live, what do you have to do? You have to swim. Your boat will come back. They will wake uh, when they reach the destination. They'll realize you're not on board. And they will immediately turn around and come back and retrace their steps. So... Best case scenario is eight hours. They'll be able to make that. Worst case scenario is about 14 hours. So that's how long you have to live for. You have to keep going for 14 hours. Um, I realized my adrenaline at that stage was pumping. I immediately felt my pulse, and my pulse was just ridiculous. It was probably at about 130. I can't be exactly accurate, but I mean, using the good old 1001, 1002 Mm -hmm. thing methodology, I kind of figured out my pulse rate was at about 150 and I knew I had to calm that down. Um, I've done a lot of meditation in my life, so I started okay. doing exercises and I just got focused on getting my heart rate down, which I managed to do quite quickly. And then I devised a very simple uh, breaststroke stroke um, because the waves were so, they kept crashing up. I tried to float, I tried to lie on my back, but every time I did, the waves would wash over my head and it was more effort in trying to, trying to um, uh, get the water out of my, because I'd swallow water all the time and then the coughing. So it actually was just, it was more, uh, it was, I used, I expended less energy by swimming than okay. I did by just trying to float. Mm-hmm. So I designed this breaststroke style and I just started swimming. The big mistake I made at the time, I was swimming, I thought, let me swim with the swell. And I was doing that. I also um, had done a bit of swimming training for, for this surf trip and I kind of had an idea in my mind of, of, of how many strokes I did in, a, did, in a, did in a 25 meter pool at the gym and kind of figured that out. So I thought, okay, you're making this amount of, time, the, 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 this amount of distance up. I thought if I could swim in the direction of the boat, even if I made up half a kilometer, you know, I'd be half a kilometer closer to them. But by that stage, I was so disorientated. There was, there was no land there. It was overcast. There was nothing to take a pinpoint on. But I found myself getting incredibly exhausted. And I thought, there's something wrong here. I know there's a strong current out here. I'm going with this. Well, I was, I was presuming the current and the swell were moving together. And then I actually started looking in my po- I don't know why, but I checked my pockets. And I found my hotel room key, a little credit card room key from... Mm-hmm the night we'd spent in Jakarta. And I pulled that out and I was looking and I think, what can I do with this? And I thought, okay, if the, if the sun does come out, I can maybe flash it and, and get a reflection off it for the boat. And inside was my credit card slip from the night. And I suddenly thought, Brett, work out where the cone's going. I tore a little piece of white paper and put it in the water and it went in completely the opposite direction. Wow. I suddenly realized, although the swell was going one way, the current was going the other. And I turned around and I started swimming with the current but I was swimming into the waves, so that was rather difficult, but I, I mean, I wasn't expending energy. I was just using that to keep my head above water, and I was floating with the current, and I just prayed that the guys could work out where the current was going. Mm. You know, Brett, I mean, no one would expect in their wildest dreams 
that something like this could happen. But almost on some level, it's as if you were preparing for a moment like this. I mean, the fact that you had been for the the swimming training, that you had you you've got uh, training as a skipper, you know the water so well, um, you've travelled, you have all of this experience, you had the paper, you there there, there was a, a level of of great experience which is which helped you with this with the survival. Nikki, you're 100 percent right. I mean, interestingly enough. A month before I went on the surf trip, I did a. I participated in an 800-kilometer charity ride, a mm. bicycle ride, road race um, that I trained really hard for, and I participated. And 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 there's absolutely no doubt that that's also played a major role in my survival. You know, my lungs were big and my legs were strong. Yeah. No so doubt. I was able to keep going on that. No um, doubt. You, you know, Brett, I, I started the show and I said, you know, I, I, I asked the audience, well, what is your greatest fear? And I'll tell you, um, one of my greatest fears is being stuck in the sea. I, I love the sea. I, I respect the sea. But I'm terrified. I'm terrified of floating on this body of water and not knowing what's happening underneath me, not knowing the kind of fish that are circling underneath, just the, being alone, being in my head for, for such a long period of time. And, and you talk about not having fear. Did that never cross your mind? Did you not think about the risk of a shark? Did you not think about um, that kind of risk at all? I did. And interestingly enough, um, after having gone through the whole day and, 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 and surviving with my boat coming back, I mean, my, my guys, they were, they, they, they were so accurate. They got to within 250 meters of me, probably two hours later. <laughs> And and I could see them and they couldn't see me and then they turned and sailed off and that oh. was my, that was the first time of and again no fear just okay this is it resignation you've 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 achieved goal number one that you set yourself out to do the boats come back and now it's sailed away and again I never felt fear I just felt resignation well I've done this and this is it you you've lost and again another tirade with God and. And a higher being just, I mean, I, I've, I've lasted so long and you do this to me. I mean, you bring my friends 150 meters away from me and then they sail away. Mm. But yeah, sharks, I mean, I was hit by a shark um, at, at dusk that evening. The, the sea had calmed down slightly and I, I was swimming and I felt this really big thud into my left, oh my uh, left side of my body. And I went, this is not good. I knew it wasn't a fish because I had a whole lot of fish nibbling on me and, and eating my skin. Um, I, I didn't realize at the time, but the back of my knees from my shorts had, had worn right through and were bleeding and the skin was really raw there and the fish were nibbling there. But again, those things all played a role in keeping me going. You know, the, 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 the pain in my legs was quite bad um, from these fish nibbling it and it became an irritation, but it kept me awake. It kept me fighting. I was trying to catch the fish to eat them. Um, but I got hit by the shark and I didn't realize it was a shark at first, but I knew it was something big and I thought this is not good. And then I, it hit me again and then I sunk under the water and I just slowly turned myself around. And it was probably at about 7 p.m. that evening. The sun was just setting and there was a shark coming at me. And it, I mean, at the time it looked like the size of a bus. <laughs> But, but when I, if I really realistically looked, it was probably about the same size as me. But the first thing I noticed was that it was a black to brief shark. Mm. Is that an aggressive shark? Is it at all aggressive? Shark, it, would, it can bite your arm. It would take, take your arm off. But it's, it's not naturally aggressive at, at humans. Mm. Um, I've dived often with black to brief sharks and find them very interesting. And you can swim up quite close to them, you know, okay. and they're not, not um, particularly aggressive. And this guy was looking at me and I was looking at him and then I thought, okay, well, if he does attack me at least, I was now so exhausted, my boat had come and gone, I, I, my, my mind was saying, at least this is going to be quick, you know, you're not going to oh my goodness. drown. And they, he literally said, and then, then again, the human, the, the, the desire to survive, my brain started going, Brett, you, you, you don't have to die here. This guy, let him try and attack you and you can maybe crazily grab around him, grab his fin, grab his tail, and and my mind was thinking it's a reef shark. You can't be that far from land because they're not they're not swimmers that'll go out millions of miles away from from reefs and, and, and coral, you know. So again it gave me massive hope. Mm -hmm. And and then this guy just had a good last look at me and flicked his fin and I don't know if you've ever died, but I mean the the, the speed and agility of these these creatures it just disappeared. <laughs> 
And you must have been so relieved. I was so relieved, but also my adrenaline was going again. My brain was going, okay, it's a reef shark. You've got to be closer to land. That means you've floated a long way. And, and again, another huge surge of hope, you know, and mm. put my mind to swimming and swimming and swimming. And I believe the seagulls were giving you a hard time. Yeah, you know, it was, it was so Of all things. I, I mean, I would never, ever have thought a seagull would attack a human being. I mean, I, but then again, I mean, I, my, I looked up, it's a little bald head bobbing out in the ocean. Mm. And these two came, came and they were circling around me and I thought, well, that's interesting. What are they doing? And next minute, the one dive bomb me and I actually had this whole screaming match with a seagull. <laughs> I was thinking, what are you going mad? You're talking to a seagull. And as these two, I was watching these two who kept trying to dive bomb me. And the third one came and I didn't even see it. And fortunately, I mean, it, it missed my eye and hit me on, on my, the bridge of my nose. Hmm. And actually took a hole in the, in the photographs when I was rescued. It took a whole chunk of skin off. But again, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been headbutted. I hope not on, on the bridge of your nose. Thankfully not, Brett. Bunted hard. I mean, it... Oh. it it's, it give, your brain just goes, ah, that was so sore, you know. And again, that, that, that got me going. Mm. And it's interesting. If I, I literally was so exhausted and given up seven times. And the first time I was stung by Portuguese and man of war, which is a little, uh, it looks like a little uh, jellyfish with a little brown center. And that, yeah. the thing's bad, but not too bad. Then I had the shark. Then I had the jellyfish. Then I had the seagulls. Then I had the fish eating my legs, and each time it was just as my body, I felt like I just couldn't carry on anymore. One of these events would happen, and it would give me hope and get me going again. So in, in reflection, it was actually quite amazing. It was almost like something was sent to me every time I had given up, re-energize me and get me going. So hmm. I, I found that very interesting. And then suddenly my brain again went, seagulls, seagulls don't fly, they can't fly They've got to land and, and rest, you know. So seagulls I must be close to land. Must and interestingly, at nightfall, it happened about an hour later. And for the first time, I saw some lights in the distance. And I suddenly realized I could see land. But unfortunately, I didn't at the time. I thought it was close. It was still a good 30, 40 nautical miles away. And it's amazing at night you, how far you can see light in the ocean because it's just black. Mm. Uh, Brett, I mean, you're talking about these moments that came to you, the shark, the seagulls, the jellyfish, you were filled with this adrenaline and the urge to survive kicked in once again. But uh, according to what I've read, you did reach a low point when you thought, this is it, I, I can't go on anymore. Well, that was, you know, I made it through the night, Nick. I kept seeing these lights and they seemed so close to me. And I've, I swam as a kid. I was a, I was a junior lifesaver at Pirates in Durban. And, I mean, I spent a lot of time in the ocean. Um, and I kind of figured out, well, that's five mid-mile miles. That's what it seemed to me. And then my brain would go, you can swim five, five mid-mile miles. And mm. I put my head down, swam, 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 and, and literally made, made it through the night. Again, another 14 hours I'd been going. The sun was coming up, and I saw this boat coming. And... It sailed towards me, and I went, hallelujah, I'm saved. You know, it kept coming at me. And then again, this thing just stopped, and I actually thought it was a fishing boat, and it stopped, and I thought, okay, they're going to throw anchor, they're going to fish there, and I can get to them, and I can just put my head down and swim. And I started doing that, and I lifted my head, and I saw this boat start up and sail away again. And that's when I just went, I cannot believe, I just, that I'm done. Mm. And I said, okay, I, I, and it was so weird, because... About a month before I went on a surf trip, my wife Anita had read me an article that she was reading in a magazine about drowning being a very pleasant way to die. It's very, you slip below, below, below the surface, it's opaque, it's blue, it's beautiful, your lungs full with water, you slip into unconsciousness and you, and you, and you disappear, you know? Mm. So I, 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 I was done, I, I, and I said, okay, this is it. I can't carry on. I'm going to drown myself because I just can't go through this anymore. And I went below the ocean. I tried to swallow water and breathe in water. It took me about 15 minutes to get my head around doing this, and eventually I just said, come on, it's time. And I just went under. I said a final, final goodbyes to everybody, got under the water, and I breathed in a full lung full of water, I remember the water coming back up out my nose and mouth and after having circulated in my body and thinking this is so warm and actually quite interestingly along the lines of the article Anita had read me and then I took another breath 
And then my brain just kicked in and said, what are you doing? And I literally exploded out of that water like a jet-propelled engine, Mm -hmm. vomiting, coughing. And it was at that time I was lying there and I was coughing and I was trying to keep my head above water and I just saw this black cross coming at me. And and I looked at it and I thought it's a hallucination. And then I started saying, God, you can't do this to me again. I'm not even going to get excited. And I just kept carried on heaving and coughing. And then this, it was actually the top of the mast of, of the boat Baron Joey that actually rescued me. And it kept coming and kept coming. And then I saw the boat. And then they turned slightly right. And I just went, no, 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 no. And then I thought, but they stayed on course. And they stayed on course. And they stayed on course. And the size of the boat got bigger. And then I figured out if I could actually just put my head down and swim, I will be able to intercept them if they stay on that course. And then, and that was my final decision. You know, I said, I'm going to put my head down and do a thousand strokes. I'm not even lifting my head up. I'm going to count a thousand strokes. I will then, and I'm going to give it everything I've got. I remember saying to Chad Leclerc, he went to the same school as me. I said, Chad, help me swim like you swam in the Olympics being chased by Michael Phelps. Mm. And I put my head down and I swam. And I limp, I counted a thousand strokes. I probably, I felt like I was going through the water like a porpoise. Or a this, o- this after being in the water for 28 hours, you're now, you're now swimming it. You're now going for it. Swimming. I'm doing crawl and I'm going as fast. I'm sure that if, if a helicopter was above me, I would have looked like a floundering uh, <laughs> non-swimmer. But I felt like I was just powering through the ocean. Hmm. I counted a thousand strokes. I lifted my head and I could see this bloke on the front of the yacht legs hanging over, his arms over, his name was Pete uh, Inglis, I'm, I got to know him afterwards, and I just started hollering. I yelled and screamed, and I saw him lift his head. I tried to wave, he couldn't see me, and I just carried on screaming. And he turned around, he, he beckoned um, the captain of the ship, he was the guy who'd worked through the night on trying to figure out where I, where I was, and he'd actually sent that first boat out, given him a cord and that told them to go right at that point, which is exactly that, what they did. He got to that point and said he was going straight, and they had a third boat coming out, and they, they reckoned I was in a 20 nautical mile area, and they were going to crisscross search that until they either found me alive or my body. And so he was staying on that course. And this guy, Pete, got up. I saw him stand up, and he was gesticulating at the, at the guys on the... And suddenly, one of the little Indonesian crew members had a pair of binoculars... He saw me. I didn't see him point to me, but I just heard this roar on the boat. All the guys shouting and screaming, we've got him, we've got him. And then the feet started waving at me, and, they, and then the boat turned directly at me, and then I knew I'd been saved. But I, by then, I was so exhausted from the swim, and being a, a, a yacht, it was not, not the most powerful engine. You know, so it was plodding along. I actually thought... Now, this is going to be an irony. I've lasted this long. They're coming to get me, and I don't have the energy to stay afloat. But fortunately, they had uh, two uh, professional lifeguards on board. Um, that, that's their permanent job in Australia. And these two guys just dived overboard with a boy, um, a life boy, and they just swam at me like two torpedoes, wow. got me into that, and by then the boat had pulled up and... The rest is history. You know, well, I, I, tell you, I tell you, Brett, my heart is beating just hearing the story. And I think that all the listeners uh, who are listening right now can just feel it and, and, and are in the water with you and, and, you know, seeing the people jump at you and save you and, and take you out the water. What an extraordinary story. So we're going to take a quick break. And after the break, let's just talk about life after this kind of experience. What is it like um, returning back to life? I know that your wife was told that you were dead. And, you know, so you you had gone to an awful place trying to end your life. She had been to an awful place hearing that you had been dead. How how do you come back from that? So stay with us, but we'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za You are listening to Radio Today, your easy listening music station. 
Welcome back. Um, this is Conversations with Nikki, powered by studyapps.co.za. I have Brett Archibald on the line who's been sharing his story of survival and resilience, and it's such an incredible, incredible story. So, Brett, you were saved. Um, this after thinking that your life was going to come to an end. Um, you were pulled on board, um, this in, these incredible Aussies who saved your life. Um, I know that uh, you then wanted to speak to your wife, but life, I suppose, you know, people calling you, interviews, frenetic, and, and I'm sure that things have sort of started to calm down a little bit. So I, I, I asked the question before the break, how, how do you come back to normal life? Um, when you face death, when you've faced your greatest fear, how do you do that? Well, Nikki, you know, it's very interesting. I, um, I was able to, courtesy of the Australian guys, uh, the doctor that was on board, um, he, he took immediate care of me and kind of nursed me back to, to, to health. Um, he allowed me to use his phone and I, was, I managed to get hold of my wife, Anita. She had literally heard five minutes before that I was alive and I'd been found. Obviously, a very emotional phone call, a lot of tears and crying. Um, and then she said, I've got a helicopter on standby. They're going to come and pick you up. We're going to get you back to Padang. We're going to get you on a plane. We're going to get you home. And I actually said to her, I said, my darling, I, I, I know you're probably not going to like this, but I really believe that I have to stay on. You know, <laughs> I have to finish this book to her. And what did she say? <laughs> she was amazing. <laughs> She, she, I think there was, she was incredulous at first, but she said, you know, I really believe I, if I'd come straight uh, back, I would, have, I would have ended up in a loony bin. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the press from around the world, I mean, Anita had fooled me in that she'd been hounded literally for those entire 28 hours while I was lost at sea, um, phone calls, emails. Uh, just it was just pandemonium back in South Africa. I wasn't aware of what was going on. I wasn't aware of the world coverage and the world um, interest in my story. I mean, right from Russia to to the U.S. to the whole way across um, Asia Pacific, South Africa. I mean, it just was insane. One of our one of our uh, uh, fellow mates from school, his wife is from Belfast, and she actually found out by by the front. Uh, the, the, the headlines of the Belfast Herald is how she found out what had happened, you know. And, you know, I just, I, I said to Anita, I'd call her again as soon as the doctors, the doctor had finished administrating a drip and all that. And, and I called her about an hour later again and I just talked to her. I, I said, you know, I've faced my worst nightmare and, mm -hmm. and my life is around the sea. You know, I, I, that's one of the reasons I moved back from London to Cape Town. I just really want to be near the sea, and, and um, I find a, a huge inner peace when I'm near the ocean. And I just said, oh, I have to go back into that water, you know, I have to make peace with the ocean, and I have to get my head around what I've just been through. And if I get back to, to crazy press people and, and everybody charging after the story, I said, I, I, I literally will go mad. So she was unbelievable. I mean, she just said, I mean, she said, Brett, I know you're alive. And that's all that counts. Mm -hmm. You just go and get yourself sorted out and have fun and be with your friends. You just have to phone me three times a day and tell me you're alive and you're okay and you're well and you're eating and everything's okay. And, and that's what I did. You know, I, I had to go through that process with each one of my, 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 my friends because you have to understand, they'd all been through their own private hell. You know, mm -hmm. we were nine of us on the boat and then there were eight and and those guys spent the same period of time wide awake on the edge of a boat through the storm everything just searching the ocean trying to find me and they and 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 you know i, I had the, the the amazing opportunity to spend quality time with each one of them individually and understand oh, their mm. real health you know and and for them to understand mine and that was so cathartic in itself you know spending that time with them uh, they were amazing when we when we were surfing. They'd say to me, "Do you want to talk to people?" Because I mean, this was global news. You know, people were paddling up to me in the ocean and saying, "You are a hero. You're a legend. It's a miracle. We got to talk to you." And my mates are unbelievable. Like they, if 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 I was feeling fine to talk, I would. If I wasn't, they'd just keep people away from me. I managed to just spend time sitting on my own out in the ocean. I have to be honest. Going back into the water. I, I actually went for a surf the next day and I went out very early in the morning. I hadn't slept well at all. Mm. 
I just wanted to go and, and paddle and just and I, I threw my board over the, the, the side of the tender boat and I dived into the ocean and that was the most horrific mm. moment ever. It was worse than actually falling over and I just knew I had to stay in the water and I just stayed under the water and just let it envelop me and be around me and, and become part of me again. Incredible. And Listen, Brett, we, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I, I've just got some, some people in the studio who are going to talk about the experience, and I'm hoping perhaps you can stay on the line and listen to what they have to say. I have Werner for Mark, um, Communications Manager for ER24, um, on the line. Um, Werner, um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm sure you know the story. I don't know if you've been listening to Brett's story. Yes, I have been listening. Also, we've been reading about it. And it's quite amazing. So definitely one of those people. I don't think it's something you want to put on your bucket list to do. Absolutely. But, but definitely uh, well done and also a legend and hero. But Vena, let me ask you this. I mean, we, we've heard that Brett is strong. I mean, he's, he's swum in races. He's cycled. He's done incredible things. Um, a person who hasn't had that kind of uh, background, that kind of training, if they had to fall in the water, I mean, let's look at the human body. How long can a human body survive in a body of water without? Without access to liquids, to, uh, without access to food, treading water. I mean, what, what do statistics say? You know what, basically, it doesn't matter how fit you are. Um, in general, though, because of the background and experience he's got in water, it definitely helped him. However, um, a strong, fit person can go for some time without um, water or food. But usually um, within a couple of hours, especially, um, let's say, if it goes to about 18 hours, your body's going to start wanting um, water, your metabolism is going to kick in, and it wants to convert the food into energy. So if there's nothing in your uh, body to convert, it's going to start um, taking um, up, up on reserves, and that's where the problems start. That is when, especially in a large body of water, which was, I think, in Brett's case, at about 28 degrees water temperature, mm. that is where your blood sugar levels are going to drop. Um, you're going to dehydrate, and you can't drink from the salt water because that's actually worse. And also with the open sun, which is um, speeding up the process, he might, um, or a general person might experience weakness, confusion, irritability, um, and bad decision-making. And that's usually when stuff starts going wrong. Does this sound like a, a miracle to you, someone surviving at sea without access to water, food for 28 hours? Oh, definitely, because dehydration um, would have set in to some extent already. Mm -hmm. um, if Brett probably stayed in the water for um, longer, uh, his body would have um, probably started giving up and um, with everything, with the water, the storms he faced um, and the hypothermia setting in, that definitely with that he would have started probably lose consciousness. Even though you fit enough with the body saying, you know what, I can't anymore, I don't have any sustenance, and there's no more energy to convert. With the hypoglycemia, the blood sugar also dropping, and um, uh, the body temperature dropping probably below 37.5 degrees, which is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You can start losing consciousness, and that's where you drown. <laughs> An extraordinary story, Vanna. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining us this afternoon and for, for putting those points forward. We do appreciate it. Thank you. I have Pam Zeman in the studio, psychologist who works in private practice. She's also an associate certified coach registered with the International Coach Federation. Hi, Pam. Hi, I've, I've noticed you shaking your head. What, what a story. Unbelievable. I've been fascinated by the story from the first time I heard it. Just fascinating. And, and the question that I have to ask is, I mean, how, how, what defines a person in terms of resilience and strength and accessing that inner strength? I mean, we, I think you've got a, a pretty good picture of Brett. Um, this is a, a strong-minded individual. Absolutely. Um, he never felt the fear. And yet very on, very early on, he had already re resigned himself to not surviving the ordeal, the, the, this whole ordeal. So for you as a psychologist I mean are, are we predestined to be strong is it is, do, can anyone access their, their inner strength this way well I think Nikki it's a, it's a both and situation there's a question of temperament which you are born with but there are things that you can cultivate as well and if you cultivate a meaning in life a purpose in life strong relationships belief systems that counts enormously 
And uh, you know what we do when we assess trauma and when we see what the effect will be on people, we look at the biopsychosocial model, mm. which is biology, psychology, and social. And when you look at the psychological factors, the best predictors of, of resilience are confidence, which it seems Brett has in abundance, optimism, optimism is absolutely huge, and also ego control. What ego control is, it's the degree to which a person can delay gratification in the service of future goals. Mm. And when you listen to Brett speaking, you hear that all the time, all the time. He was able to delay that gratification in the service of his, his, his goals. And the other thing that he had was hope, huge hope the hope that he was going to be saved, the belief that because of his relationships, his friends were coming back for him. Mm. So if you've got that, if you've got hope and you've got purpose and optimism and this belief, I mean, optimism is a huge factor. You know, before Roger Bannister won the form, uh, ran the four-minute mile, it was believed to be completely impossible. People thought it, it wasn't a human, a human physical possibility. And once he'd done it, within a week or so, lots of people had run it. So it's, it was Brett's belief in the possibilities, the possibility that he could survive, in his, the, the belief in his own strength, and the belief in, in others, the hope that others would mm. come out and save him. Not an easy question. We've heard from Verna about what happens to the body, how long the body can survive, and Verna seems to think that he didn't have much longer from a physiological point of view. Mm. Do you think it was his mind, this positive mind, this approach that got him through it? I do. I think that you're, you're, but you know, you, but what, you, what you think is what you feel. And I think the way that he's, he, he managed his thoughts, all those, the way he spoke to himself, his self-dialogue, how he said, okay, Brett, you can do this. You, you know how, how, and I think his, his knowledge of the ocean, of the water, all of those things, all of those resources he drew on, he drew on his knowledge, he drew on his abilities, he drew on his belief Which in himself. Which gave him control, didn't it? That's exactly it. It made him feel like he was in control and that, of the that, situation. That, 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 that's the other thing. The cognitive beliefs, one of the very important cognitive beliefs in resilience is the belief that you can influence your surroundings and the, art, and the outcome of events. And he, you, you see that all the time in listening to him. He believed, he had a belief that he, was, he had some control. Mm. Even though if you look at it from the outside, most people would think that this is, you've got no control at all. You're being swept by the currents, right. you're being, you could be sucked under. But he kept thinking, what can I do to, to manipulate these events? What can I do to control my, my situation? I can swim a thousand lengths. I know what the time is. I know that if the seagulls are there, I must be near land. So you can see that in this, from an outsider observer's perspective, you think it's hopeless. There is no control. Internally, and his self-dialogue all the time was, Brett, you can do this. Brett, you have control. Mm. There are people out there looking for you. Mm. So I think with, without that, of course, biology is king. He had the strength and the fitness and, and all of that. Um, but he also had a mindset, which I really believe allowed him to just to do this miraculous, uh, this miraculous feat. What I also find very interesting is he started off saying he, he didn't really always believe in God, and yet he turned to God very, very quickly. And there's, there's a very dialogue with God, God through all the time. And there's, there's a lovely joke that says, you know, you're not going to find many, athe many atheists in an overcrowded lifeboat. Mm. All of a sudden, you know, people start turning to God. And faith is another enormous thing in resilience. They mm. find that people who, who have religion, who are religious, um, are of extremely resilient and resilient. It's partly because of what um, the community and what that gives people, which is the social side of the biopsychosocial model. If you have a strong sense of community, that's a huge protective factor for resilience. But it's also just that belief in God. Mm. And the, the other bigger thing, picture, the bigger picture. Mm. The other thing which he said was um, mindfulness. Mindfulness practices, meditation, being able to to cut things into to bite-sized pieces. I can't do 26 hours, but I can do one moment to go from one moment to the next, <laughs> and that's also a huge protective factor. That's I think it's such a lesson for all of us, isn't it, Pam? Really is. Pam, thank you very, very You're much for joining welcome. us. It was most lovely, welcome. lovely getting your input, uh, Pam Zeman, on uh, radio today. Brett, are you still with us? I'm still here. So uh, T.S. Eliot says, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? Brett, how tall are you now? I'm, physically, I'm 1.7. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but mentally, I am, spiritually? I'm, you know, spiritually, every day is just an amazing day for me. And, and the, the, the take-home I take out of this is, 
you know, for, for a good 15 years of my life, I, I chased the wrong things. You know, I chased material things, homes, cars, big jobs, houses, bank balances. And, and I have to tell you, when you're so close to meeting your maker, you don't, none of those enter your brain. I mean, it, it becomes about family initially, I mean, immediately, friends and faith. And I, I, um, I had no doubt that the, the faith and that I managed to, to, to believe in and, and the prayers and the wishes I got from around the world, it, it was insane. And those prayers really, I believe, carried me home because physically I couldn't have done it. I mean, it's ability. Brett Archibald, well done. Thank you for coming onto the show. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for inspiring listeners. Um, and um, I just hope that you're going to be writing a book and that we can read the book and that we can follow your steps. You've been incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki. Have a wonderful day. And you. Brett Archibald on Radio Today. What an extraordinary story. And, of course, Radio Today is sponsored by studyapps.co.za. I do hope that you enjoyed the show. I will be back with you in a week's time, same time, one two two. And, uh, again, if you'd like to email me, if you have any feedback, it's Nikki at NikkiSeverini.com, spelled N-I-K-I. And I will be putting the podcast on my Facebook page page and that's Nikki Siberini talk show host. You take care and I'm looking forward to being in your company in a week's time. Goodbye. Conversations with Nikki was powered by studyapps.co.za. This is Radio Today, the radio station that delivers.